As you might have seen, you received an email saying that uh, we should be on time today because we have to leave the room at 11.50. So I want no presentation. And uh, so the goal of today is to discuss a little bit symbolic dynamics for non-uniformly hyperbolic surface diffeomorphisms. And it is to discuss the result that I mentioned on Monday which is Sarik's theorem that says that if you get a C1 plus beta surface diffeomorphism, given any Hi positive, you can find a universal topological Markov shift and a universal coding, which intertwines the dynamics of the diffeomorphism with the dynamics of the shift map that is relevant for all measures that are Hi hyperbolic simultaneously, and that has the finiteness to one property, okay? So forget about these sharp things and so on. The goal is to, at least in the level of non-uniform hyperbolic dynamics, to discuss a little bit how to construct the symbolic dynamics. Okay. So before that, I would like to remind us of what we did yesterday. So yesterday, it's right here. Good. Yesterday we discussed the method of pseudo orbits due to Bowen, and we can divide it into four steps. The first step is finding good coordinates for the system, and these coordinates were given by the Lyapunov charts, which in particular have the property that if the orbit of a point, if the image of a point is close to another point, then you can consider the map F with respect to these coordinates at X and at Y, and this change of coordinates, it gives you a map FXY, which is hyperbolic-like. So it is close to a hyperbolic matrix in a uniform domain of size epsilon. That allowed us, after, first of all, the size of the domain is uniformly bounded from below, so it is enough to get a finite set of these charts that are delta-dense in the manifold, and that allows us to apply uh, graph transform methods in order to construct an infinite to one extension. And how is the infinite to one extension given? Well, you constructed this finite set of Lyapunov charts. So the set of vertices is going to be exactly the set of these Lyapunov charts. And you're going to say that you have a transition from one Lyapunov chart to the other. Whenever the image of the center of one chart is close to the center of the other and vice versa. And when you have that, well, this map FXY and its inverse are going to be hyperbolic-like, and being hyperbolic-like, you can apply the graph transform method, and so you can construct this map pi that to each sequence sigma of Lyapunov charts like that, which is nothing but a pseudo-orbit because the requirement here, the nearest neighbor condition is just that the one point is close to, the image of one point is close to the next point, so an element here in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this symbolic space is just a pseudo orbit. And the graph transform method allows us to, to each pseudo orbit to associate a point, which is given by the intersection of this S curve with the U curve, right? This is the unique point that is shadowing the orbit of these Lyapunov charts, okay? Good. So uh, we saw also that this map is usually infinite to one, so we need to do a further step, which is the step of bowen sinai refinement. And how do we do that? Well, this map pi induces a good cover on the manifold, and this cover is given by the projection of the zero of cylinders in the symbolic space below. So each ZV here is the projection of the zero of cylinder uh, with position V. So this is going to be a cover in your manifold. And whenever you see a non-trivial intersection, how do you destroy them? You destroy them dividing one of the elements, one of the, the elements of this cover dynamically into four pieces. Then you consider the refinement of all of these partitions. This refinement is going to be a mark of partition that is going to define to you a new finite one symbolic model, okay? So this is the summary of yesterday. And what we want to do today is to try to do more or less the same scheme for the case of non-uniformly hyperbolic dynamics. 
So the first difficulty is step number one. How do we generate good systems of coordinates on which your diffeomorphism looks like a hyperbolic matrix? Well, as I told you yesterday, the case of uniform hyperbolicity is very good because everything varies continuously. But the sole definition of non-uniform hyperbolicity is an almost everywhere statement. So in general, you do not have things varying continuously. They, at most, they vary measurably. So we cannot do exactly the same thing as we did before, but we can do similar things. So the step number one, okay, so before the setting that we are going to work today is just to leave it here in the blackboard, is that of uh, surface diffeomorphism, which you assume a regularity C1 plus beta, and you want to code he hyperbolic measures. So you are given a positive he, and you want to code he hyperbolic measures. So what is the definition of non-uniform hyperbolicity, as I told you, is an almost everywhere, everywhere statement. And how am I able to code all he hyperbolic measures at the same time? Well, I'm not going to look at measures, but I'm going to look at points that have a good enough hyperbolicity. So you get a point in M for which there exists vectors, unit vectors in the tangent space of M And the requirement on this point is that the limit, so the Lyapunov exponent associated to this S direction is smaller than minus he log of dfn esx is smaller than minus he. You can actually take this limit for both future and past. And the same thing for the EU. But now you assume it to be at least he. If we are able to code all of these points with this property, then we are able to code every he hyperbolic measure because every he hyperbolic measure is carried out by the set of points satisfying these conditions. In general, you do not code all of these points. You have to add some sort of recurrence condition, but some recurrence conditions are very cheap because you know that invariant measures, they are recurrent, so you are in good shape. But what I want to discuss is how to, from a point satisfying these two properties, how to get the equivalent of Lyapunov charts in the non-uniform hyperbolic case. Well, these charts are known as passing charts. And in order to define the passing chart, first I would like to introduce three parameters, which are the parameters S of X, U of X, and alpha of X. And what these parameters tell us is how good the hyperbolicity at the point X is. So S of X is this weird sum here. And U of X is something similar. And alpha of X is just the angle between ES and U. So first of all, note that this is a sum that is finite. Why? Because you know that the limit, the first limit here is smaller than minus phi. So this goes to zero exponentially fast. So you are in good shape. This is finite. And this is square root of two here is just made so that this number also is bigger than one. So this belongs to one infinity. And the same thing for this number here. What, is, what are these numbers measuring? Note that whenever S of X is big, it means that it takes a long time for you to see the, the contraction in this direction. So in some sense, S of X is measuring how good the hyperbolicity in the S direction is. The worse the hyperbolicity in the S direction, the bigger S of X, S of X is, right? The same thing for U of X. U of X measures somehow how good the hyperbolicity in the U direction you, ha you have. 
So this number is big whenever it takes a long time for this to go to zero. So I'm saying exactly that it takes a long time for me to see the contraction for the past in the unstable direction, all right? And alpha also measures somehow how bad or good the hyperbolicity is. Because whenever ES and EU are very close, this means that it is very hard for you to distinguish between the stable and unstable directions. So in the uniform hyperbolic case, you do not have that. You, you have a uniform angle bounded away from zero and from pi over two, for example. So these three parameters, they some, somehow measure the hyperbolicity of your point, all right? Okay. Why? Just to make this to be bigger than one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as you remember, Lyapunov charts, we first define a linear change of coordinates, right? A map from R2 to the tangent space. So I'm going to, to do the same thing here. So I'm going to let C of X from R2 to TXM be the linear map that is sending the first canonical vector. Okay, remember what we did yesterday? We sent the first canonical vector to the stable direction and we sent the second canonical vector to the unstable direction. And this was good enough for us to see that the derivative of the map in these coordinates is hyperbolic-like. In this case, this is not going to work. Why? Because you should take into account uh, how good or bad the hyperbolicity in this direction and in this direction are. So what you do is exactly to introduce these two parameters, S and U, here. You divide by S in the first, uh, in the first vector and you divide by U in the second vector. And these guys are saying what? Are saying that whenever you see a bad hyperbolicity, C of X is taking a vector which is big to a very tiny vector. Or reversely, it's getting a very tiny vector and it's zooming in to a very big vector. So you are zooming in the hyperbolicity in order to see uniform hyperbolicity. And this is actually the case. So you have this lemma here, which is called Ozeledet's Pezin reduction. That tells exactly that when you look at the derivative of the map in these coordinates, you see a hyperbolic matrix. So what is it to say that you see a hyperbolic matrix? The first entry is smaller than e to the minus he. So you see the he coming up here. This is smaller than one. And you see b bigger than e to the he. Okay, so this map with these changes here are good enough for us to see the derivative as a hyperbolic matrix. But lambda, which lambda? Huh? Chi, yes. This is lambda if you want. Oh, this is lambda, smaller than one. So, okay, so we did the linear part. We were able to, to see the derivative of the, of, the, of the diffeomorphism as a hyperbolic matrix. Now we want to see F itself as a hyperbolic matrix, right? So define the passing chart at X as a map defining a domain that I'm going to tell you soon. But the way that we want to define is just like yesterday. We want to get this map C of X and compose with the exponential map. And our first goal is to see that that map f of x that I defined yesterday, which is the map f in this system of coordinates, is close to a hyperbolic matrix. Right? Well, as you see, what happens here? Psi f of x minus 1 has the inverse of this, exponential of f of x minus 1, c of x, c of f of x minus 1. What happens if you have a bad hyperbolicity? What, when you have a bad hyperbolicity, is exactly what I said here. You are sending a very big vector to a very small one. 
Or reversely, the inverse of the map is send a very small vector to a very big vector. So whenever you see bad hyperbolicity, the, the norm of the inverse of this map is going to be very big, right? So when you compose it here, you're going to see a big distortion. When you see a big distortion, it is hard for you to compare f of x with its derivative at 0, because you can change a lot. You know that f of x at 0 is equal to this guy. In order to get that f of x in a small neighborhood is close to hyperbolic, you should, you should know how much f of x is getting distorted. It is getting distorted because you have this inverse here as much as the inverse norm of this guy is big or small. Okay? So this is the main problem. The main problem is that contrary to the uniform hyperbolic case, the size of the passing chart depends on the hyperbolicity of the point. The worse the hyperbolicity, the bigger is this inverse norm, the smaller should be the size because you see a bigger distortion. All right? And actually, you can see that the inverse norm of C of x, you have an explicit formula for C of x, so you can calculate the inverse norm. And actually, it's not the inverse norm, it is the Frobenius norm of this inverse, is directly associated to the hyperbolicity parameters S, U, and alpha by this formula. So this means exactly when you have bad hyperbolicity, you see that either this number or this number is big, or this number is small. So this is reflected by saying that this number is big. And when you see this number big, you should consider the passing chart in a smaller domain. And that is why we introduced a parameter capital Q of epsilon. And it's going to be exactly what remains here in the definition of passing charts. So it depends on this norm. And it depends how. Well, I put a very negative exponent here. So you see that whenever this is big, this number is small, because it's a big number to a very negative power. right? And I can actually put an epsilon to the 3 over beta here. And this epsilon to the 3 over beta has two purposes. First, to get a uniform bound for the capital Q. And second, it's for when you do the calculation, sometimes you want to, to, to absorb constants that appear in the calculation. And this, and this, con and this number here is going to allow you to, uh, to do that. OK, so this is OK. So, OK, so we define the size of the passing chart. And now these guys are good enough What? Q1 plus beta, yeah. So now with this definition, f of x is close to the same hyperbolic matrix that we have as a lattice passing reduction. So we are in good shape. Yes. OK. So this is lemma 2 from yesterday, and now we want to prove lemma 3. What is lemma 3? Well, what we want to do now is not to put here f of x, but to put a point nearby to f of x, right? And this is the first difficulty that we encounter. And Sarig introduced the notion of epsilon overlap. And what is that? Well, it is exactly a requirement to guarantee that this map is close to a hyperbolic matrix. So what we want now is to find conditions on x and y for which when I change f of x to y here, I still get the same result as I wrote there. So what conditions guarantee f of x, y to be close to a hyperbolic matrix? Before 
we only required that the point f of x is very close to y. Why? Because these things, they are varying continuously. So whenever they are very continuously, this thing can be seen as a perturbation. How do I put this? Yes, as a perturbation like this of the map f of x itself. And if y is close to f of x, then this is very close to the identity and we are in good shape. But now what happens with this composition here? In this composition, what is going to appear is the composition of c of f of x with the inverse norm of c of y. And in principle, because things only vary measurably, having y close to f of x does not guarantee that c of y is close to c of f of x. And that is a problem. So the way that we define if y is close to f of x, not necessarily c of y is close to c of f of x. And then I would have a perturbation that's very big. This is not close to the identity. So how, how did Tsarik deal with this problem? He said, OK, don't, don't worry. I'm going to restrict the possible edges that I have. And I'm going to say that I can pass. So right that I can pass from one charge to the other if I need to have the proximity of the points. So this is very small. And the same thing for the inverse. But I require more. I require also that C of f of x is very close to c of y, and I'm not going to put the quantifiers here, and c of f of minus 1 of y is very close to c of x. And when you have these conditions, then a transition from one passing charge to the other guarantees by definition that this map is a small perturbation of a hyperbolic map, so it is, again, hyperbolic-like. Okay. So because the work of Sarig is long, I decided only to focus on two main steps of the proof. And to me, this is the first one. This is the first uh, good definition that he introduced in order to guarantee that you have this hyperbolicity here. OK, so, so we are able to define uh, what passing charts are. And as we saw here with this definition of epsilon overlap, we are able to guarantee that this change of coordinates here is hyperbolic-like, OK? So what we try to do now is to continue with the sketch of proof of Bowen in this non-uniform hyperbolic case and see what are the difficulties. OK. So OK, so coarse graining is before we wanted to press to a finite set of Lyapunov charts. But why did we have finite? Because the sizes of the Lyapunov charts were uniform. So we only require finitely many to cover the whole manifold. In this case, as you see, you have bad points, points with bad hyperbolicity in which this size can be very small. So it is usually not possible to get finitely many passing charts to cover the whole manifold. But you can still get countable. How? You just get a countable and then set in the space of all passing charts. So you pass to a countable and then set to the passing charts, and these are going to be enough for you to code all points x that we are considering here, OK? So let's keep going with the sketch of proof. So the next, uh, the next part is to construct an infinite one extension using the graph transform. So what is the topological Markov shift? Again, the set of vertices is going to be the set of uh, passing charts that we constructed. This is a countable set now. But no problem, and the set of edges is going to be the set of transitions from passing charts with these conditions here, with these properties which I called, which Sari called epsilon overlap. So once we have this topological Markov shift, well, just observe again that in particular an element here is again a pseudo orbit because you are assuming these two properties here. But it's more than a pseudo orbit because you are assuming further two properties. But 
Never mind. So the idea is to do what? Is to apply the graph transform method in order to, for each pseudo orbit to associate a point, right? So remember from yesterday that how is the graph transform? The graph transform works in the uniformly hyperbolic case. So the graph transform f of x, y, s and f of x, y, u. What did they do? They, they were associated to an edge. So whenever you see a transition from Lyapunov charts, yesterday the sizes of these Lyapunov charts were uniform of size epsilon. So what could we conclude when we got a curve that is almost vertical here? Well, we could conclude that its image under this map f of x, y would certainly go all the way from top to bottom. And then we could restrict ourselves to the part of the curve that is inside this, this square and define this to be the unstable graph transform. That's how we define the graph transforms. Well, now we no longer know whether the size of the chart at, uh, actually let me just put f of x here. The graph transform that goes from x to f of x. Now, uh, in order to implement the same idea, the same, the same method of graph transform, we require that the domain of the passing chart at x and the domain of the passing chart at f of x are comparable, are close to one. Otherwise, you could be faced with the following problem, that if, for example, q epsilon of x is very, is much smaller than q epsilon of f of x, then what would happen, or much bigger, I'm sorry, then what would happen is that this is the, the domain of the passing chart at x and this is the domain much smaller. This is the domain of the passing chart at x and this is the domain of the passing chart of, at f of x. So what happens with the image of a U curve here? It would not go all the way from top to bottom. So you need a good control on the ratio of the sizes of the passing charts in order to implement the graph transform. And this can be done because these numbers, capital Q of epsilon, have a good property. And what is the good property? Is that they cannot go to zero exponentially fast. So lemma, the limit of 1 over n log of q epsilon f n of x as n goes to plus minus infinity is equal to zero almost everywhere. And because of that, I can define a better size for my passing charts. And I now call this size small q epsilon. And how do I do that? It is a formula that's relating the rate of convergence, the expansion and contraction that I have with the sizes of the charts. And this sole property here guarantees to you that this number is positive. So it is positive. It is by definition at most the capital Q. But now I have a good control on the value of it at f of x with the value of it at x. What happens is that this belongs to e to the minus epsilon, e to the epsilon. If I take epsilon to be small, this number is very close to one, and this picture doesn't occur. So the hyperbolicity that I have, which, which is at least, at, at least e to the re, if I take epsilon very small, will be bigger than the possible distortion that I see for these small cues. Conclusion is that 
This property guarantees to you that you can define a number potentially much smaller than the capital Q on which you can apply the graph transform. Just apply the graph transform for curves of size small q. Okay? So, okay, we are good. Uh, here I put that you also need some strong assumptions on the definition of S and U curves. You can look at the paper if you want to, 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 to understand that, but never mind. So what the graph transform gives to us is this map. It is an infinite one extension of our map F. And what is the last step? The last step is the bowen sinai refinement, right? Now you want to get the cover that is induced by this map pi. So you look at the projection of zero cylinders of the symbolic space to the manifold. You get many sets like this ZV. So this curly Z here is going to be a cover of your of your manifold, not of your manifold, but the relevant points that you want to code, never mind. And what you want to do is to destroy non-trivial intersections. So for every pair of rectangles in this cover, you consider that dynamically defined partition of Z into four pieces. What is, are these partitions going to give to you? Well, you can consider the refinement of all of them. And this is going to be a part, the, a partition that has a Markov property, right? So everything seems perfect. End of proof. Well, no. That's when the nightmare comes. Why? Because these Markov partitions can be uncountable. Why? Remember that the cover Z, Z is itself a, a countable partition. A countable cover, right? It has countably many elements. It might happen that when you refine a countable family, you get an uncountable family. For example, consider the family of all intervals in, the, in 0, 1, which have extremes in rational points. This is a countable family of intervals, but the refinement of all of them is given by points, which is uncountable. So we have to be much more precise to guarantee that this R is countable. And what is the property that we require for that? The property that we require is local finiteness. So to guarantee that R is countable. It is enough that our Markov cover Z is locally finite. And what do I mean by that? I mean that every element of Z intersects at most finitely many other elements of Z. Okay? Okay, so in order to do that, unfortunately, passing charts are not enough to guarantee this property. So what was the solution encountered by Sarig? Was to define a new object that somehow separates the future from the past. And before defining them, Okay, so uh, why do we want to separate future from the past? Well, you know that in the non-uniform hyperbolic case, so non-uniform hyperbolic systems, by definition, the future and the past behavior can be very different. And it is not being seen by this small q here, because this small q is considered a minimal in the whole orbit, right? I would be able to separate the future and the past, analyze the future separately from the past. Why? Because in general, non-uniform hyperbolic systems, they have a different behavior in the future and in the past. So why not, instead of considering this parameter here, I consider the one-sided versions of them? So let me introduce two parameters.
the stable Q epsilon, and this is taking the minimum only in for future. And the unstable Q epsilon, which is taking the minimum for the past. Let me just finish this thing here. Yes? That I can make a different definition. The vertices of my, of my topological Markov shift are not going to be passing charts, but they are going to be two-sided versions of passing charts. And these are going to be good enough to guarantee to you that the cover Z is locally finite. I'm changing the construction, yes. So the way I understand the introduction of this new object is exactly by separating the future from the past, so you have these two numbers, and observing that these two numbers, they satisfy a greedy recursion. What do I mean by that? I mean that the parameter QS epsilon at x Satisfies this equality here. It is the minimum between two values. And how do you understand that? You get the value of it at f of x and you multiply by e to the epsilon. And you take the minimum between this and the maximum it could be, which is q epsilon of x. So in some sense, you can also understand q as epsilon as a measure of the local stable hyperbolicity of your point. And how good is the local stable hyperbolicity of your point at x? Well, it is as good as you have it at f of x and what you gain when you iterate backwards, e to the epsilon, and the maximum that it can be. So similarly, you also have that qu at f of x is as good as it can be. How? Well, you see what is its value at x, then when you iterate it forward, you should gain some hyperbolicity, e to the epsilon, but this number cannot be bigger than the highest hyperbolicity that you are considering. So these two properties hold. And these two properties induce to us to consider the two-sided versions of passing charts, which we call here epsilon double chart. So what is an epsilon double chart? It is just an abstraction of the passing chart, but now having two parameters, which you could see just as a pair of maps. The restriction of this map to this domain PS squared and of the same map to the domain PU squared. But the idea is that this map is going to take care of the stable behavior of the graph transform of for the stable direction, and this map is going to take care of the graph transform of the unstable direction. So now we define new uh, objects, which are these epsilon double charts, and we want to make sense of when do you have a transition from one of them to another. So how to do that? How, how do we do that? Well, first of all, you want to have an epsilon overlap in order to be able to pass from one to the other, but you also want to relate these parameters PS, PU, QS, and QU. And what is the relation? It is exactly given by these greedy recursions. So you require that the PS here is equal to the minimum of e to the epsilon times the stable parameter here and the maximum it can be, which is the q epsilon of x, and qu to be the minimum of e to the epsilon pu and q epsilon of y. Okay? So now I define this new object. I define how to go from one of these new objects to another one. How? 
well, to have the old property plus this grid recursion involving the hyperbolicity parameters. What is the motivation for this? You can see as it comes from the definition of the stable and unstable small queues. All right? So with this new definition, let us see what happens. And now we have five steps in the method of the proof. The first step is, before it was the introduction of passing charts, now it is the introduction of epsilon double charts, which are these guys here. So it's, you can just see as a pair of passing charts in different domains. And well, you want to pass to a countable set of them, no problem. You just look at the space of all epsilon double charts, you pass to a countable and then set subset of them. Good, step two is okay. Step three is to get an infinite to one extension. Before we were already able to do that, so we do exactly the same thing. But now our topological Markov shift, the, the vertices of it are going to be epsilon double charts and the edges are going to be that definition over there. So you should have epsilon overlap of the two passing charts and maximality of these four hyperbolicity parameters and the maximality is given by those two equalities over there. Okay, so what does this allows you to do? Uh, allows you to consider the topological Markov shift and now I call a sequence on my graph, a path on my graph to be an epsilon GPO, epsilon generalized pseudo orbit, just a name. So now from every epsilon GPO, again using the graph transform, you can define a point in the manifold and it is given by the same identity that we had before, which is this identity here. But what is the difference now? The difference is that the next step would be to consider the cover Z and then to refine it. What we required, and I wrote it over, over there, is to have Z to be locally finite. So now we have a step three and a half, which is called an inverse theorem. And what is the inverse theorem? It is exactly telling you when the map pi that we constructed here can lose the injectivity. So what do I mean by that? I mean that whenever you have two epsilon GPOs that have the same image under pi, you wanted to be able to prove that the parameters of one is close to the parameters of the other, such that whenever you fix one of these guys, you do not have many options for these guys. And this is somehow saying to you that your marker of cover is locally finite. Well, the theorem that Sadiq proves is the following. You have to require a further assumption, which is that these two sequences are recurrent, in some sense, you are just saying that the points are returning to a set of good hyperbolicity bounded away from zero. And this is very cheap from the point of view of ergodic theory. And you wish to prove that the parameters of V are very close to the parameters of W. And this is actually what Sarik proves. In other words, he, he writes V, which is an epsilon generalized pseudo orbit. So it's a sequence of epsilon double charts here. And he writes W. W in the same way, and he compares the parameters of these charts with the parameters of these, these charts. Well, that Xn is close to y, Yn, we already knew, because it is a pseudo orbit, but these things are new now. That the stable parameter of, uh, of the nth chart of V is close to the stable parameter of the nth chart of W. And the same thing for the unstable parameter. With this inverse theorem, you are able now to apply the Bowen now refinement. What is the cover? What is the Markov cover? It is almost the same thing as before, but now I only consider the projection of se sequences that are recurrent. Why? Because it's only in this space here that I have the inverse theorem. So when I project only restricted to these guys, I can conclude that this cover here is locally finite. Being locally finite, I can refine it and not get something that's uncountable. I get something that's countable. So I do exactly the same thing. Whenever I see a non-trivial intersection, I partition uh, the rectangle into four pieces and then I consider the refinement of all of them. Now, with the help of the inverse theorem, I can prove that this cover here is, is locally finite. Hence, this cover R, this partition R is countable. Because in principle you could have, you could be encoded, you could have an orbit that has 
pseudo orbits that are in some sense nested. In this way you would get uncountably many. You would not be locally finite because a point here would belong to infinitely many elements z sub v. And why this can happen? This, the size of this chart here can be very small because either the future behavior is bad or the past behavior is bad. When you separate the future from the past, you are able to separately control it. And, show, and, and then what you, what, you do, what you show is that these charts here are not going to be good for coding. Because I would have, I would have to have a maximality of either the stable or the unstable parameters. Okay? So you separate in order to control. Yes, exactly. You separate, you can get a better control of it. You are able to show that it, it, it varies up to a bounded arrow, and then you are good. And when you don't separate, you cannot see that. So I, I mean, maybe it's possible, but I don't know a way of, uh, of uh, getting the construction only considering the small Q epsilons here. Because it can be bad for many reasons. Okay? So now we got a countable cover, countable partition. And this is the end of proof and the end of time. Thank you. <laughs>